Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Uh, the show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's perfectly fine. We do record the show every week and it is then posted onto our website. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access the um, archive. Um, both the live show and the recordings and archives are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Um, we uh, do quite a mixture of things here, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, uh, demos of services and products, uh, basically anything that we think may be of interest to libraries. Uh, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska um, and for all libraries, so all types. So we will have things on the show for public libraries, academic, K-12 schools, corrections, museums, um, anything that's a library, that's really our only criteria, library, it's a very broad topic. Um, sometimes we do have Nebraska Library Commission staff come on and talk about services or products or um, things that we're doing here, um, but we also bring in guest speakers to join us. And as we have this morning, um, sitting with me today is Tom Rolfes, who's actually from the state of Nebraska too, so. Correct. State of Nebraska for a year. Um, he's from the Nebraska Information Technology Commission. Um, and remotely on the line with us uh, from all the way on the West Coast at the moment <laughs> is uh, Carson Block. Good morning, Carson. Good morning. Good morning. And they're going to talk about the uh, Toward Gigabit Libraries project that they um, that Carson been working on along with a lot of states, including Nebraska, um, as one of the uh, testing areas, pilots. Yep, yeah, one of the pilot states. Pilot states. So um, I think we're going to start with you, Carson, to take it away and tell us about what we're doing. Outstanding. Thank you. Thanks for um, for joining uh, this morning and today. It's uh, so wonderful to keep spreading the word about uh, the Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit. Um, and so because of the, uh, the, the audience for this presentation, I'm going to give you kind of a complete picture of what the toolkit is, including what it can do for you, uh, <laughs> including in a personal level. Some people have taken this toolkit and used it in their houses. So um, uh, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. So, um, uh, so I'm gonna, but, I'm, but I'd like you to see the full picture because it is, uh, it is an interesting uh, sort of process. Uh, my name is uh, Carson Block. I'm a, a library technology consultant. Um, but I, I actually have worked in a library. I've worked at a lot of libraries. Um, I've been working in libraries for about 25, 26 years now. Uh, before I uh, consulted, I worked uh, in a number of uh, contexts in libraries, uh, all in Colorado. Uh, before consulting, and now I work nationwide. But uh, in Colorado, one of my jobs was as a staff consultant for uh, one of the uh, regional library service systems that existed at the time. And I, my, my, uh, my role was in North, uh, uh, Northeast Colorado. And in Northeast Colorado, I worked on a lot of. I was a technology consultant working on a lot of connectivity um, uh, issues. And during that experience, I. Uh, got a deep and abiding love for uh, rural libraries and especially the challenges that they face. Yes, you heard that right. I love the challenges that uh, <laughs> rural libraries face because of the impacts that, that each have in, 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 in the community. Um, there's also this incredible advantage to being a small library, believe it or not, because I know there's, there's a lot of disadvantages, but one of the advantages is when you get just a little bit of information that can improve your, your lives. You take the ball and you run and you make things happen. Um, so this is what's been gratifying about this project because this is what it is exactly uh, designed to do. Uh, you can learn more about me by, by going to my website anytime. Um, I'm visible, so I won't go into that. Uh, but specifically for this project, it was just, just, just the right thing and, and things that I love. I don't want to go farther without talking about our project staff, though, um, because um, it, the three of us um, uh, 
were the core project team uh, for this project. Uh, uh, and, and I'd like to say something in tribute to James Worley. Uh, James uh, was one of the project managers who worked for Internet2, and I'll talk about Internet2 in a moment. Uh, James passed away uh, late last year um, uh, quite suddenly, but after, after some illness. And so uh, we miss James quite a bit, but he was heart and soul uh, of this project. Um, also, Susanna Spellman, um, who is, is uh, flourishing and, and doing so well, uh, Susanna uh, left Internet2 uh, right before the end of the project uh, to work in the private sector, where she has a lot of experience and success. Um, but the three of us formed the core team uh, for all the work that you see, and uh, I don't think this would have happened in the same way without without our three personalities kind of, you know, power team unite and uh, uh, making this, uh, this happen. But there were a lot of others who helped. Before I talk, I'm gonna play a video. Doesn't that sound lame? I'm gonna play a video though, because this video is so important to spreading the word, and this video is something that you can use to refresh your memory as to what the, the toolkit's all about, as well as to tell others about it. It's one of those explainer videos that's so popular right now. So I'm just gonna hit play. Welcome. This video is designed to give you an ultra quick overview of how to use the Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit. You'll be up and running in no time. The Toolkit is a free open source technology learning, diagnostic, and advocacy tool designed for public and tribal libraries in the US. But the Toolkit can be used just about anywhere in the world. The Toolkit will guide you through a series of questions about your technology environment and provide you with all the information you need to answer the questions. The toolkit is an excellent way to diagnose and fix problems that you may be having with your library technology. Some libraries have found it especially useful in preparing for e-rate requests, budget cycles, and even in helping open up lines of communication between library staff and tech workers. Best of all, you do not need to be a techie to use the toolkit. While it's always helpful to have someone with technical knowledge to assist, this toolkit was piloted with more than 60 rural and tribal libraries in 11 states to ensure that it is as simple as possible for you to use. The toolkit is divided into several key sections covering the types of technical challenges you're likely to encounter in your library and ways to solve those challenges. In the technology inventory section, you will find and understand some of the key pieces of the technology inside your library, including your network, computers, and other important technology components. This inventory will help you understand what sort of equipment you have now and provide a basis to determine if you need different or additional equipment for the future. In the broadband services and activities section, the types of broadband services and applications are discussed in order to ensure that you have sufficient bandwidth to support patron and staff use of various devices and applications, both today and into the future. Technology in libraries is more than just a collection of gear. People, including library staff and those who provide technical support, are just as important. In the Broadband Technical Operations Support section, you will learn more about the people who help make technology available in your library and determine if there are any areas where you can benefit from additional support. Technology expenses are important budget considerations for all libraries. In the Broadband Funding section, you learn about several opportunities available to help provide funding for your library broadband connectivity. The topics listed in the Additional Resources and Best Practices section are designed to provide you even more insight and resources into improving your library's broadband connectivity and services. You may find these items helpful in gaining a better understanding of your broadband connection, data network, and computers. The toolkit also has a handy glossary section at the end for quick lookups of technical terms. And don't worry about completing the toolkit from end to end. It is designed to address the most common technology issues in libraries, so it does cover a lot of ground. You may need to only work through the sections that are the most important to you. After you've completed the toolkit, you can use another document called the Broadband Improvement Plan to create your own long-term and short-term strategies to improve your technology. Wondering how to find the toolkit materials? Everything is available at our website. The toolkit is free and open source. And if you like, you are free to use anything from the toolkit and mix it into other documents. This may be especially useful for state library organizations, rural and education networks, library consortiums, and others who would like to customize the toolkit materials. After you've used the toolkit and the broadband improvement plan, we would love to hear from you. Click on the link in the comments section of this video to share your experiences. Now, grab the toolkit and make it your own.
And that's the uh, that's the the uh, the toolkit explainer video, um, and it, it covers everything. So we can just take questions now. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm gonna talk a little bit more um, about what's uh, what we have uh, happening here. Um, one of the tricks for the embedded videos is getting to the next slide, but I did it, and I'm so happy. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about. Um, um, how the grant was was formed. So, um, IMLS um, are the uh, Internet to uh, contacted our IMLS for a grant application um, to to perform this. And this was based on on a lot of uh, discussion in the library community for the need uh, for better technology. And so, uh, Internet to if you're not familiar with them, um, they're um, a, a, a basically a network. Back in the day, it was created as like the next generation Internet, uh, connecting uh, all sorts of higher ed institutions at super high speeds. Um, uh, today, it has evolved into something uh, a, a more of a, of a of a community of uh, what are called anchor institutions and different uh, providers of connectivity. Uh, a lot of times that they they're serving a lot of public institutions uh, like schools and, and Tom will talk a little bit more about um, uh, his uh, you know connection on that that part of the world uh, the the school networks though and the library networks sometimes talk to each other sometimes they don't in, in terms of interacting it just depends on the state um, but as you can see from this map there's a lot of nodes or locations for internet too uh, serving uh, public entities uh, all over uh, all over the, the country um, and uh, the uh, they also have something called the community anchor program and that's that's where James and Susanna were um, were affiliated now the grant was a two hundred fifty thousand dollar grant from IMLS which is the uh, Institute of Museum and Library Services it was awarded to internet Two in the spring of 2016 it was a three-year grant to develop training curriculum and assessment material, which was what we call the toolkit for li library broadband infrastructure. Uh, we were targeting very rural and tribal libraries, and our partners included state library offices and what are called R&E networks, which are research and education networks. Um, we wanted to pilot it in at least 30 libraries, and because we were, were uh, efficient with our funds and we had such great support from our partners like, um, uh, like Tom and Holly and the Nebraska. Um, we were able to go to more than 60 libraries to pilot this. It was so uh, incredible. The the process uh, that we used, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were doing a good job because there's nothing worse than somebody coming coming in from outside saying, "Hi, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help you." Um, <laughs> we uh, we we did not want to do that, and so we wanted to make sure that we had lots of stops to make sure uh, that not just the, the toolkit itself and the content of the toolkit was good, but that it was also a useful experience for everyone helping us, um, because we needed to, of course, you know, reach folks who could, who could benefit this the most. I don't know about you, but I don't know of a single library worker in the country, no matter the size of the library, who has lots of time um, to do something that isn't useful to them. Uh, so we were very cognizant uh, of that. So we had lots of check-ins. Um, uh, the uh, the core team, we came up with the initial draft of the materials, and then we had what's called a, a subject matter expert. That's what SME stands for, um, a, such a, a subject matter expert workshop of folks from all sorts of different library institutions, sizes, technical abilities. Uh, we had tribal representatives. Uh, everyone that we could get to come in and tear that toolkit apart. We, we said, this is our best first chance. Please come in and, and just rip it apart. Let us know what's not working, what you don't like. Um, and that is what we kept on through the entire process of the toolkit development. As we received feedback, we made iterative changes uh, because our goal was not, you know, not to be right. Our goal was to do the right thing and to make sure this toolkit, if, that, if possible, could stand on its own as a standalone tool. So we continually uh, updated the materials uh, uh, based on the, the, the SME uh, workshop and then the pilots, of course. Uh, and then we finally you know, finalized it and we released it uh, into the wild uh, last year. The toolkit is actually does three things at the same time. It's an educational workbook. It's also a self-assessment tool and it's an advocacy platform. And these things uh, all work together uh, really well because the more you know, the better you can advocate for yourself and for your needs. Uh, to know where you're at or what you know, you need a way to assess your current uh, technology resources. So it was important that this did all three things at the same time. Um, the, uh, the, the toolkit components um, included a technology inventory of broadband connection, wired network, 
network devices, services, support, broadband funding, et cetera. That's why if you look at it, it's kind of thick <laughs> because we tried to make it as small or as thin as possible so that it would be user friendly. And, and, and we have found that it is user friendly, but when you first look at the toolkit, if you download it and print it, you're gonna go, you might go, oh my, that's why that looks like a lot to wade through. It, it, there's a lot of content there, but but please don't be intimidated by that format. I think once you open it up and get started, you'll see that it's not uh, intimidating at all. Um, the, the, our process that we use, though, is we needed to make sure that we had the right folks to talk to, and there are so many right folks to talk to. It was so hard um, uh, to, uh, to 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 uh, settle on the ones that we did, um, uh, but the ones that we did were were excellent. The other thing that we wanted to do, and this was based on some experience I've had with similar programs in the past, is we did not want to visit someone who didn't really need our help or assistance. Um, while it's important to test the toolkit, we wanted this to also benefit directly the library that was helping pilot us. We wanted to, to leave some value there and leave some good things there after we left. And so um, this was part of that. So we, we did have a uh, intake survey to make sure that we had an understanding uh, of our pilot libraries and could really drill down on, on what the needs are. Uh, we did our, our visit and during our visit, we did the toolkit process together um, in partnership um, uh, with our with a, like our, our local partners. And so that, would, that was Tom and Holly in Nebraska. Um, and, and we had other different partners in different uh, states that we visited and different uh, tribal areas. Um, we also created a broadband improvement plan. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's the, the suggestions for things to do in both uh, short-term and long-term chunks. Um, and um, then that completes the process. Now, the approach to the toolkit um, is, is, again, it's one that we developed uh, over time. Uh, and the idea is that we're asking, uh, through the toolkit, we're asking questions in specific categories, and then we're giving the resource to help you answer that question all contained on that same page. Now, some of the stuff you need, would need to follow a link, uh, a web link, because um, uh, there's richer information, but we tried as best as possible to make sure that the question was answerable by what you could have right in front of you to at least get started. So there's a question, there's um, uh, there's choices to answer that question, and then a resource uh, right with it combined to help you answer that question. Um, we visited a, a lot of places. Like I said, we got to see um, twice as many as as we budgeted for, and that's just because of, of uh, the, the just the wonderful partnership and teams that we formed. Uh, on this map, you can see all of the public libraries in blue and all of the tribal libraries in kind of an orange um, color. And it was important to, to visit both. If uh, A lot of times if we're, uh, if we're in a public library, we might not be familiar with uh, tribal libraries and, and vice versa. Um, they have uh, completely different needs sometimes, even though our core uh, missions tend to be the same. Uh, the needs and the environments, uh, the resources uh, are, are all different. And um, But we're all trying to provide service to our community uh, through technology. Um, I wanted to share some uh, survey uh, results uh, because these are awesome. Uh, and this is, I think, uh, will prove the point that we hit the right people. Um, as you can see that most of the, the, the folks that we um, uh, worked with were standalone library. So even those that were part of a, of a library system, uh, this wasn't like a large uh, or a significantly like a, like a well-heeled sort of library system. But most of the folks um, were a standalone uh, library. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, as you can see from this chart, uh, technical support uh, is not uh, at the top of uh, availability <laughs> for, for most of the folks. And it's like, that's perfect because that is the, the situation that we want to address in the best way we can. So we want to work with folks who don't have um, a great deal of, of, of IT and tech support. Uh, we also wanted to check in on the experience that people had. And as you can see, um, uh, you know, more than just, just a little over than 50% have limited experience, 44% no experience. And then that little tiny sliver uh, folks felt very experienced in, ter in terms of their uh, broadband and, and technology in their library. Um, we also asked about hopes and dreams um, because again the reason we have technology in libraries at all is to serve the needs of our community it's there as a tool to serve um, uh, folks even when it gets shiny and it and it gets awesome and cool 
at the bottom, at the end of the day, the purpose of the library is to serve community needs in, in, the, in a way that's unique to that community and specific to that library. And so I wanted to check in with what people wanted to do. And I think if you look at these quotes, you're gonna see things that may ring true for you or, or at least for others that you know. It's a lot about access. It's a lot about bringing up our communities um, uh, together, uh, a sense of comfort and mastery in uh, using technology, um, a way to uh, even the playing field in terms of rural and urban when it comes to, to um, uh, competing. Um, and there's no reason when you've got connectivity that you can't do anything anywhere these days, um, but you need the connectivity. Opportunities, um, employment, et cetera. Um, you might wonder, so what did you find of those 60 libraries? These are, these are some of the top uh, issues. Uh, insufficient bandwidth for sure, just, just bandwidth <laughs> connections that were too <laughs> low uh, even for a single user, let alone for a library trying to serve multiple users. Uh, found lots of data wiring issues. Um, you know, there's a misconception that once you install the wire, you're done. Well, you know, in some cases that wire wasn't installed very well to begin with. In, in other cases, it was not adequate for, for the way that the library ha had grown or the, what, the way the library needed to do things. Um, we saw a lot of inefficient network setups. Um, you know, Building a network is usually a combination of boxes that are plugged into each other with, with wires, or they're using wireless technology to, to connect those boxes. And there's uh, there's optimum ways to connect that so that they work really well together, and there's ways that are not so optimum. Uh, so we saw a, a great deal of, of network setups that, that could use improvement. We saw lots of old and obsolete equipment. Uh, again, I think on the network side, if a network's working, it's kind of invisible, right? So we don't really think about it that much. And um, even in larger institutions, uh, not just in small and rural and tribal libraries, um, not everyone knows that you need to replace things, <laughs> that there's a useful life for equipment. There's a duty cycle. Um, and so uh, we were able to, to, to spot that. Lots of poor Wi-Fi coverage, of course, and that's a, that's a common challenge, but um, uh, it, and it scales, right? It scales up and it scales down. But Wi-Fi coverage, especially as demand for Wi-Fi goes up, uh, has been an issue. And then also not participating in E-rate, and that was um, a significant now because of with the changes a few years ago in, in uh, the E-rate structure, there are more, there's more money available to libraries to do uh, infrastructure improvements for those wishing to participate. Um, so in, in some cases, this made the difference. Um, as we were going, like I said, we had so many wonderful partners. We took feedback and we kept this massive spreadsheet. Every piece of feedback that came in, even if it was a question that came up before that we felt we had answered, um, the team would consider um, and look at it and decide if we should make a change to the toolkit um, or um, or leave it alone. And there there were some things that we went back and forth on as we went forward because as, uh, as, as a goal of having our materials as clear as possible, being challenged in this way was the best possible thing. Um, and it helped reinforce some of the decisions that we made uh, uh, going forward. Um, if you're not a technician, um, this is this is like a common joke, but if you're not a technician, you can ask the, the question, how many technicians does it take to screw in a light bulb? It takes five. One to screw in the light bulb and the other four to tell you how you could do it much better. Uh, <laughs> so um, I know it's an old joke, but the, the, the point of that is that we want to listen to all of those five things and then ask ourselves, not from the, uh, the technician's point of view, but from the library's point of view, what what makes the, the most sense? Because sometimes there's a technical solution that is superior, but it might be too hard uh, or too much to ask of, of a, we're thinking of a, of a solo librarian on the plains of Nebraska, right? And, and it's like, do they want to deal with having to even understand this concept or do they just want to get it fixed? So that was one of the things that we used as a measure. And, and so that, that tension throughout the toolkit was super help, healthy. It was very good because it made us challenge our assumptions and it kept our brains active the whole time as we were trying to do the best job that we could. Um, we, uh, we, we wanted to make sure that we were doing a good job, so we asked questions uh, all along. Um, I wanted to share some of the, uh, we had a survey that we sent to participants after um, uh, the, the, the experience, and we were delighted to see that, that we were uh, being effective as a, as a community, and this was all of us, in, in reaching our marks. Um, uh, understanding, um, uh, so the satisfaction for, for increased understanding uh, 
those are great numbers. Those are super great. Um, knowledge increased in some, in, in almost across the board in, in things, in, in broadband funding, uh, use and activities, network devices, Wi-Fi, computers, the wired network, the connection, et cetera. Uh, what, we, what we saw was uh, just a general increase um, in, in the folks feeling more knowledgeable in key areas. The overall experience with the pilot program, yowza, <laughs> that was so, so, um, uh, so good to see, to, to, to see that reflected because again, we know how hard it is for folks to stop and, and then have this visit with people, you know, we're taking over your life for like half a day and nobody is half a day to do anything you know that's not worthwhile so we were happy to see that that folks felt that that time was valuable and then of course this is my favorite one would you recommend it <laughs> this, uh, it was quite good to see because you know again there was a, for me having worked with a lot of uh, rural libraries directly um, I know that if we're not you know if we don't walk our talk it's not going to work um, and it's not it's not good for anybody. Um, and uh, so this this is actually the one that made me feel the best uh, because I don't know anybody in library land that's going to recommend something that doesn't work. Um, so now a little bit more about the toolkit to go back. We talked about the structure and the process. Um, uh, the toolkit is broken down into these areas. The first is a technology inventory because you have to know kind of you know what you have and what shape it's in before you can know what to uh, to to do with it. And in this one, we looked at the broadband connection, network devices. The wired network and power, uh, wireless network and power, and computer and user devices. In the broadband services and activities uh, section, we looked at the needs for bandwidth, uh, things like hotspot lending, internet filtering, and different services that might ride uh, in that. Uh, broadband technical operational support is the next uh, section because we know that that is a um, an uneven area throughout rural libraries. So you know, is there staff available for uh, technology support? Training resources, are they available? Is there tech support from your internet service provider? Um, how is the service with them? And, and are they, you know, are they good with uh, helping you? Uh, also broadband funding, uh, looking at uh, prices and what things cost and what discounts um, and other ways that you might have available to you to, um, uh, to get the funding you need. Um, we had a lot of things that didn't make the toolkit, but they were important. So we had a, have a section on additional resources um, and uh, best practices that covered a lot of things outside of the scope of the toolkit. And then one of the favorite sections from people around the country is the glossary, um, having a place to look for common terms that that uh, that come up. And so that's the overview. And frankly, I think that's enough of me talking. The best thing to do now is to talk to one of our wonderful partners and say, so how did it actually go? How is, what were the actual experiences? So Tom, are you ready to uh, to hop on and chat a little bit? Sure, that'd be fine. Excellent. Um, so we'll do we'll do a little Q and A, and we're so sorry that that uh, your partner in Nebraska, Holly, is not not able to uh, to join us. Holly Waltz of the uh, on Nebraska. the road today, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. but <laughs> yeah, but we uh, very much involved with the project, or um, as as you, and she's actually I believe that's her in the picture there yeah. in the top one. Yes. Yeah, that top picture there in the back is Holly, and on the left there is Tom at one of our. And you know which library yeah. that is? Happens to be way more. Way more, awesome. <laughs> That's all. That's that's wonderful. Yeah, and Susanna's there with you too. It's nice to see uh, uh, Susanna. Um, Tom, um, how? And maybe you can also uh, speak to your rec your recollection of of Holly's perspective as well. The teamwork approach um, that we had in Nebraska that it's one of our best examples of, of this. Uh, how did you first get involved with the toolkit? Well, uh, and by the way, thanks, Carson, for the intro. Uh, I had had a relationship with Internet2 and James Worley and Susanna dating back to the mid-2000s. So as Krista mentioned in the intro, uh, one of my job roles, Nebraska Information Technology Commission, another hat I wear is helping manage the statewide network for schools, colleges, and three library systems. By being part of Network Nebraska, like 41 other states, these networks are also joined the internet too, which was uh, the you know the principle, the impetus behind the grant program of uh, how we can better reach rural areas and assist our library counterparts 
in better broadband, whether they connect to the statewide network or not. So that was my interest. In Nebraska, we're very fortunate. We have uh, 244 school districts. They're all connected by fiber to the state network. Uh, we've been able to bring down their internet rates by you know amazing amounts and that they're all working closely together. But our small rural libraries are quite the opposite. Um, many of their bandwidth uh, supply, their providers, the costs that they pay, and their participation in E-rate would be considered on the other end of the spectrum from where our school districts are at in Nebraska. Right. And that may be true of other rural states. It, 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 indeed it is. Yeah, to uh, participate in that toolkit pilot because um, we're nothing without our public libraries in rural Nebraska. And uh, another interest of mine is what is called the homework gap. So again, our students are well cared for with technology between 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. But when they leave school and they go home, we know that between 15 and 20 percent are without internet at home and therefore they return to their rural community center and either go into or sit outside the library for internet. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't do them much good if, if the supply is not functioning properly or the bandwidth isn't high enough. Right. So that was the backdrop for my participation and then the, relied on the library commission to name the five pilot libraries that were part of the Nebraska effort, the pilot visitations, and they range from Northeast Nebraska to Southeast, North Central and Western. So the communities ranged in size from 1100 to 8,300 population. One of them being 8,000, we consider that a medium to large size community. Yes. Our definition of what is a small library in our <laughs> rural states is much different than even IMLS's uh, definition. Yeah. But. but they were certainly all under 25,000. And it was uh, it was a good opportunity and experience for me to be able to spend some time, as Carson mentioned, three to four hours in our intake interview using the toolkit at every library as we went from place to place and finding out the state of their uh, internal connections as well as their external and how high a need there is uh, within rural Nebraska and many other states. Now, what were the uh, communities that, for those people that don't know, that we did yeah. do the pilots with? For the Nebraskans on the call, you'll recognize some of these communities alphabetical order. <laughs> Atkinson, uh, Gearing, Valley, Walt Hill, and Wymore. Yep, so the Wymore is in the upper left corner. I believe that's the Valley location in the lower right who happens to have a special reading room in a bank vault, yeah. which is where <laughs> their remodeled building is. So it was pretty amazing as we went from one location to another and see the not only the infrastructure, but also the physical structure mm -hmm. of the library that they are working with. Yeah, to try and what they have to work with physically to get all this um the wiring upgraded and where can they even put in these computers or cables or whatever yep. they need yeah exactly and carson i've got more to share but you might tease that out of me with some of your questions <laughs> well i i um uh i would like you to uh actually i'd like to 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 keep um talking about this track that you're on right right now, instead of instead of going to the canned questions, because what uh, what this reminds me of, Tom, is how uh, delightful it was to meet you and Holly, and especially how invested um, you became personally. You became and Holly was as well in in actually sleeping the issues that that we were discovering on the site visit that we were together with, as well as the ideas that 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 you had generated and looking for opportunities for collaboration. And I think that's 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 what that was my takeaway from Nebraska was not just the, the good work that we were able to do together, but the the spark that came from it. Well funny you should say spark. <laughs> so, um, you know, part of the uh, hours of wind chill time that we had traveling together and I really didn't know Holly very well prior to the project, but uh, it turned out that we had 
you know, a shared passion for rural Nebraska. She had had many, many dozens of library visits for from a previous grant effort. Right? right, we had one of the BTOP grants through IMLS a few years ago where we installed um, computers and, and uh, furniture into libraries. And she yeah. was actually, that's actually how she ended up with the Library Commission, the Nebraska Library Commission. She was hired to be part of that project, um, that specific grant project. And then when that ended, um, we actually hired her on as a permanent staff person yeah. here. And she has a little bit different background from a typical state library person. And, she has a computer science degree, and my uh, degree in preparation is in education, science, technology, and admin. So uh, when you talk about team chemistry, I think we presented some really good uh, compliments to each other. I had the, you know, the large-scale macro technical background, working with all the telecom and cable companies in Nebraska, uh, dealing with fiber procurement cost of internet, and Holly had boots on the ground experience in a relationship with every library director that we met. And so uh, we were able to go back and forth uh, during, during the pilot phase with the interviews and the projects. And uh, what one of us didn't know, it was a high likelihood that the other one would. So that is how we descended on these five locations. Um, just talking quickly about their bandwidth and uh, the five pilot sites that I mentioned deal with five different uh, telecom providers and they have bandwidths ranging from basically three megabits off of a water tower to 100 megabit uh, via a fiber connection. Mm -hmm. So there is great diversity even within those five and it, it has nothing to do with their geography necessarily it, it more had to do with uh, how a particular provider has made investments in a particular community over time and uh, the water tower example um, is a community that's in high need so even though the school might be gigabit fiber that did not expand to the rest of the community and most of them are using either satellite internet or shared internet off of fixed wireless from the water tower, mm -hmm. which is exactly where the library got their internet. So their findings were at five o'clock when everybody came home from work, the library internet went to almost zero. Yeah, so that- So many people are using it. Correct. The same connection in the whole town. So yeah. that led Holly and I to think about a Sparks grant with IMLS and we proceeded to apply and were awarded $25,000 to work with five libraries and then we added an additional and we're able to connect each of those libraries up with their gigabit school partners and now we're able to drop in over 100 megabits using homework hotspots within each of these libraries so of the six that became part of the sparks grant uh only one of them came from this initial toolkit right, uh, so that's five more libraries sample, in addition right? to this yeah. so between the two grants we're able to reach you know, 11 different libraries uh, raise their technical expertise and also, in some cases, quickly drop in much faster bandwidth to supplement uh, either cable or DSL internet that they're using with their patrons. So, uh, and we have many more ideas, <laughs> yes. more ideas than we have time uh, <laughs> yes, right. for, for what we can do and help change the landscape in Nebraska. We hope. Uh, all of your pilot states are having similar experiences that it, you know, introduce new concepts, new uh, team chemistry, getting our state agencies uh, to work more closely together, and then uh, really create a positive effect uh, for the libraries that are most in need. We saw that in some places, and in some places it wasn't as strong because the connector or the, the motivation uh, to, to do so was a little bit harder. Uh, Arizona um, had a similar experience um, uh, uh, that that you and Holly had in terms of teaming and being able to to uh, resource together in a, a powerful way. Um, I think uh, what we saw more often than not was was more like a micro uh, example of this because you're talking about um, two agencies collaborating and finding new opportunities to serve a lot of people. Um, the toolkit. 
uh, served as a venue for libraries that did have some tech support, but they weren't talking with each other. And so being able to sit around and talk about these issues together, have a shared vocabulary, um, uh, was also very powerful on, on the micro level. Um, and so I think that was a parallel that happened in most of the places that we went. There was tech support. Um, the but the but the the differences between some of the states where where you had extreme like like you two are awesome man and have vision and the juice to be able to pull that vision off. Um, other states struggle with that, and it, it made us think about how that part of the just, just how exponentially powerful that connection is, and is it possible to cultivate? Uh, in the future, so that's where my brain is right now. It's like, how do we, how do we get that going a little bit more strongly? And sometimes I think it takes just uh, the time and just keep pushing for it. It doesn't always work the first time through. I mean, this, uh, the Sparks grant and the, the the toolkit here are huge success stories. But I can tell you, Tom has been coming to us at the commission for years before we did these with ideas about how to get this, the libraries faster internet, how to get them onto this backbone that's already in the state. And it just wasn't, it just wasn't happening yet. There was just a, too, um, too many hurdles, convincing the school, the libraries mm -hmm. of, that this is something to do, uh, cost potentially um, issues. And, um, but he just kept plugging away at us and <laughs> it wouldn't go away. <laughs> <laughs> and it was great ideas and everything, but it was just getting, getting, you know, figuring out the exactly, you know, on the ground, how do you make this work out? And then finally, the Sparks grant, I think, was the first thing. I'm not sure which time, which timing was of the Sparks one compared to this one. Yeah, Sparks first, or they the This was okay. exactly two years ago. Okay. Uh, this month that we did most of our travel in Nebraska was one of the earliest pilot states. Yes. Yeah, and then things are finally coming together that we're figuring out how we can make it happen, convincing the libraries to do it. Um, I know Tommy's presented at our state library conference for quite a few years before we actually managed to get some libraries we were willing to actually you know, yeah. and go I, all in on it. Yeah. One thing, you know, I'm a typical, well, maybe not typical taxpayer because <laughs> I'm plugged into some of the technological things in the state, but who knew when you look at the numbers of our 260 libraries in Nebraska, you can pick any state and then start looking at their self-reported bandwidth and look at their providers and look at the cost that they're paying. Right. It was like a revelation for me to, to learn wow. that because I deal with schools and they're all fiber and we try to bring down their costs so they can buy more and it's more affordable that within 12 blocks of these same community anchor institutions sat another public entity a public library that is quite the reverse yeah absolutely. in most schools, cases yeah, total other end of the spectrum correct schools getting yeah and i considered that a major unknown that was i go we need to tell this story and so we're using other efforts uh, within the nitc and the education council that I work with. And remember, this wraps back to digital inclusion and the digital divide and the homework gap. And while our rural uh, entities, both residents, business farms, and public libraries, are somewhat stuck in time with their infrastructure, yes. there are some notable positive exceptions. But in general, they've had the same infrastructure and speeds that they had five years ago. In the same five years in Lincoln, Nebraska, every house now has access to fiber. Mm -hmm. uh, they now have a minimum speed of 300 megabits, which is probably 20 to 50 times faster than any library that we visited. And in the meantime, their, their cost went down. And so that's normalcy in a rural, or excuse me, an urban environment. Mm -hmm. And their libraries are also fiber. They're also connected to the statewide network. But there's a huge chasm between a community of 300,000 and 3,000, or maybe 300. And so uh, it can't just be a local issue. Uh, Carson, you can tell I'm on my soapbox. <laughs> uh, it can't just be a local issue because the local fruits of their labors have gotten them where they are. So I think we need more of a you know, also a statewide effort, and there's also federal dollars available that we're not taking advantage of through the E-rate program. And I think we can approach that in a more uh, systematic fashion. 
So I hope those dreams for Nebraska are also uh, reminiscent of what you're seeing in other states, Carson. Yes, um, uh, the um, uh, they they are, but you're especially strong in Nebraska. I just want to give props. I want to give props to you because yeah. the um, in many in many cases uh, in other uh, places sometimes the 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 the, the spirit is willing. Um, uh, but it's really hard to negotiate through. And that's part of what I was trying to talk about with um, uh, the advantages of, of the rural landscape versus uh, some of the larger urban. Um, I think most of us are smart when we work in libraries and know what the right thing to do is. There's layers of politics in, in many organizations that make it, it's just it's just how it is, and it's very hard to make change. Um, in, in rural areas, we can be agile, and especially agencies serving uh, uh, many rural communities, we can see ways to be, to be agile. Usually the biggest uh, hurdle is um, availability of funding or availability of infrastructure, like trying to figure out how to get infrastructure in. And, and it takes thinking and creativity to look at existing resources. And that's what I admire so much about you, Tom, is, is you're really good. Instead of saying, well, how can we dig some new money out of this or that? You're like, hey, have we uh, maximized what's on the table right now? That is such an excellent strategy, and I admire that, um, uh, your thinking and your actions in that area, uh, because that is right. Um, that's the way to do it. And, uh, you know, the Sparks grant was a good example. Uh, and again, microwave, uh, fixed space wireless was a limitation, right? Nebraska, we didn't know we were had so many trees until we started <laughs> trying to plot a, a site visible pathway between the school rooftop and the library. Mm -hmm. So in a couple cases, uh, and this would be true of any partnership that develops in a rural area, if you can't get that connection, you find a way. So in one of the Sparks uh, library situations, we used a public safety tower as a relay. So the school and library couldn't see each other, but they could both see the tower. So you know, a little permission in a small community, and lo and behold, they dropped in at 120 megabits, and they had 20 previously. Uh, in Wymore, that particular challenging community, uh, we ended up using a public power district to help us uh, plant a telephone pole in the yard of the library that was big enough to see over the trees of the mayor's house. Because <laughs> That just happened to be strategically uh, barricading between. the pathway to the school <laughs> rooftop. So uh, these all go kind of dovetail with your action plan concept, Carson, within the mm. toolkit is, okay, we know that our bandwidth is inadequate. What do we do about it? What do we do now? Yes. Can we, you know, do we have an upgrade path with our provider? Can we afford more? Uh, can we make better use of E-rate? Uh, could there be community partnerships where, you know, the school superintendent library director are willing to share bandwidth like we did with the Sparks grant? That was only $2,500 per community. So those things are well within the reach of many of these uh, situations. They just need to think creatively. Exactly. Ravi <laughs> How so, are we doing any questions? Do you have any, anyone in our viewing audience? Uh, yeah, anybody, if you have any questions or thoughts on this, um, type into the question section in your GoToWebinar interface. Or if you have a microphone, uh, just say, I have a microphone, and we'll unmute you and you can ask your question that way. Um, I know we've got people here from our Nebraska libraries, um, but also people from out of state. So um, this is, you know, we're talking a lot about Nebraska here because what we did here, but as you saw on uh, Carson's map, this was in lots of other states as well, um, the pilot projects for this. Um, and now it's available for anyone and everyone to to actually see it. So I saw some from Texas. And Texas, if you're out there, you know, show us your representation <laughs> and uh, get online. Yes, Texas State Library Archives, yeah. <laughs> Did you do one in Idaho too? Because someone from the Idaho. Uh, yeah, we we did do um, uh, we did do Idaho as well. Yes, they're awesome. I know they were talking about it. Yeah. Um, so go ahead and type in questions if you have them, or any if you were involved in any of these pilots, uh, or if you've already looked at the toolkit. Because this, as you said, this went live well publicly to everyone last 
last fall or earlier in the year? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was early. It was early fall uh, yeah. uh, when it went out, and and uh, I know that the state e-rate coordinators, a lot of those uh, folks have uh, mm -hmm. grabbed it and, and have been using it. Um, I think some. Let's see, who was it? Someone's already remixed it because we have the Creative Commons license. It's like take this and, and use it into another format. Um, mm -hmm. Let's grab that and created the whole little thing. It was New York, um, uh, and New York was not one of our states. But New York has a lot of rural and, and small libraries, a lot of yeah. small communities in, in, in parts of the state that aren't the city. Um, mm -hmm. So they've they've remixed it. I saw a, a screenshot um, from someone's presentation uh, for that. Um, the uh, I'm just trying to th oh um, uh, Kinber um, the Kinber uh, uh, Connectivity Consortium in uh, Pennsylvania um, they're they're doing some work with with that I might drop in a, on a webinar such as this um, uh, to assist with that um, the scenic we're going to do a presentation at the scenic conference about this as part of a group of other IMLS grants and the scenic is is in California um, and it's a uh, an organization that's worked with uh, the California State Library and another uh, California organization to provide a high speed bandwidth to every library in the state and so it's when I say high speed, uh, their target, I believe, is is one gigabit connection, uh, despite you know at, at minimum. That's like the baseline. So of course, some of the larger libraries in California need more than that because it, there's a lot of people out here in California, as it turns out, um, and a lot of people to serve. Uh, but there's also a lot of rural areas in California that if you're not if you're not out here, you don't often think of of the smaller places and, and places that also need connectivity. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't really think of the big the states that have the biggest population as well. They're big population everywhere, and it's not like New York and Texas and California. They think, oh, it's just all cities. And no, I'm from New York. It's there are rural. It's just as rural there and the smallest town, towns as there is here in Nebraska. There's yes. just not as it's just not as much, but they're still out there in their little the, the spaces. Five hundred population serve towns needing the yeah, and not having that fast connection. Yeah. Right. Well, one of the fun things I think in New York is you don't have to drive so far in between little hamlets. That's true. <laughs> They're right next to each other. They're one right after another. Yes, that is true. <laughs> in Nebraska, it's like, okay, I've got my car. I'm driving here. It's going to be a little while. Uh, I'll between... be here four hours. No problem. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah, uh, yeah for, as for E-Rate, yeah, I'm the state E-Rate coordinator for Nebraska, actually. Oh, yeah, that's right. Did, yeah, and um, I did last fall when I did my training, because this had, I, well, obviously I was keeping an eye on it because we were involved. Um, as soon as it was live, I added that into my workshop, into my slides. As um, After talking about the different things you can get E-Rate discounts on, I said, and if you don't have a clue, because this is, this is actually is mm -hmm. the part where a lot of our libraries kind of, Lose the lose the idea in applying for E-rate. You can get an E-rate discount on um, construction and equipment, and not just your monthly internet costs, but getting this, these things set up for you in the first place. If you do need to upgrade, and people kind of lose it at that point of, well, but what? And how do I know? And I get so many questions of, well, what do I have? What what is my router or or my whatever? And I'm like, I don't know that, but here's this thing that you can take now and figure it out and what you do have. And that's why I love what you're talking about in the toolkit. The um, It's not just fill in all these answers, it's explanations about what these things mean. Definitions yes. of this is what you're looking for. And if you don't know, talk to this person in your yes. town or find someone who knows the IT, um, um, has that skill and they will show you where this piece of equipment is or what you're supposed to be looking for and, and how it connects to something else. Um, so it's it's not. Don't be scared of it. I um, people, it's you know, it's, it's you know, it's technology. It's a tech plan. It's whatever, and I don't even know what to do. It guides you through it all. I'm so it, it's so good to hear that because um, that's the true test of the toolkit. Is you know because that's what we tried to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, everybody gets to choose whether or not that actually happens because we all have different levels of, of, of knowledge. I do know that in my experiences with um, uh, this toolkit specifically, um, folks who had not ha had thought of technology as a black box, as soon as they realized it's they can understand the components and how the components work together, it became like anything else in their life and uh, that they could make decisions about it, especially how to approach it. And I think that that's probably the most uh, powerful, surprising thing that, that people have is, wait a minute, you're 
telling something that was mysterious is now more clear in plain language. And now that I know what it is, I definitely have opinions on how this fits on my my priorities and how I want to do things. So I think I think that that's um, uh, you know in our highfalutin way we're like that's our 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 piece of advocacy, and we can talk about advocacy as as the you know the ultimate outcome of that because that's what happens. But I think you know pre advocacy is just having understanding. <laughs> you know what is this thing? And and then being able to like on the cuff talk about it, have your elevator speech. Um, oh, yeah. the, the, the first part of this, the to tech toolkit is figuring out what you have. And then it does, and what I thought was interesting that I think I didn't expect was that extra part about funding. It's not just what I have, yeah. but yeah. now that I know what I have, what are the ways that I can get the money to get, make it better? Yeah. And um, that's where you end up talking to your stakeholders and your mayor and your um, board members, whoever in the county in your area might be in charge of the money <laughs> or able to influence the you know, the influencers there. And once you know what you've got, you can more easily explain it to them and explain why they need to increase your budget or why you need to have the help to apply for this grant of some sort or um, figure out how to use E-Rate or anything. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. So, Carson, if I would have guessed, your next slide would say, where do we go from here? Um, but <laughs> we do have me... one comment that someone did say that I okay. did want to share. Um, and it was actually right at the same time as you were talking about it. So it's kind of funny. I, I saw this pop up, and you just mentioned this, that this library says, my library was picked last year as one of only five in the state of Pennsylvania for a study by Kimber Associates for the broadband study. Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, so one of those libraries is on, and that was just – so is that – has that been done or is that still being worked towards that study? I, be I believe Kimber's going to launch that. Um, now, I, 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 one of the hard things about the grant is, you know, once it's over, we lose like like day-to-day -to -day touch with what's happening. So I may, I don't want to be speaking out of turn, but I think um, mm -hmm. uh, the idea at, at Kimber is they, they're, they're, they're piloting this further um, and customizing it because they've got a lot of uh, network expertise. That's what they do, right? And so they're they're targeting it for the needs that they have. So I'm really happy to hear that um, uh, that you're one of the folks working with Kimber, and um, I hope that it's a good experience for you yeah, as well. Because it's still in the works. Yes. So they're they're they've been picked and they're still working on getting it going. Yep. Awesome. Right on. Good. Go go go. Do it. Yeah. We need more of this done. More of this kind of research. Yeah. So it's great, Carson, that the toolkit's in production level. It's uh, linked to Creative Commons. It's public domain and usable, downloadable by all. But if Polly were here, she'd be talking about the Library Commission's ideas for the toolkit yes. to live on. And I think Chris is going to provide some of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Holly. Holly Wolt is our one of our IT people here at the Library Commission and um, uh, many of you Nebraska libraries, as we mentioned, would know her. Um, either she's been out there for other uh, grants, um, the BTOP grant we had, the Sparks grant, um, currently working with the, uh, we have a community engagement maker community space. Maker space grant going on yeah. now. We're on with this, but she's involved in all these things. And uh, But related to the toolkit, she, we were actually just talking to her on the phone about this on Monday. Um, and she wants, she's going to plan on doing some sort of monthly, regular, sort of like office hours online for our libraries, um, where she'd set up like a go-to webinar session like this for anybody to come in and talk to her um, to help them complete their toolkits. Um, I, so rather than having to go, like, I'm going to travel around the state to 20 different libraries, they can just log in and live chat with her um, on a regular basis and get the, you know, figure out what they need to enter if they have questions. You know, like we said, there's a lot of helpful stuff in there and the glossary and everything, but sometimes she said you need to talk to another person and just hash things out. Yes. And she wants to set that up and she's actually talked to our continuing education coordinator, which is another Holly, Holly Duggan, <laughs> um, who um, they're going to work on um, if you complete your toolkit and um, submit that to Holly Wolt and she looks it over and says, looks all good, you can earn continuing education credits for actually doing that, doing that, putting that thing together for your library. So um, definitely trying to encourage some more libraries to do it just not only to get the information, but to earn continuing education credits for it, um, which then can go towards your library's, your certification and your library's accreditation. Um, but then Holly's going to try and do a regular be available for anybody who has any questions about it. Um, so that will be coming. Uh, we have to still schedule it and get that all worked out. But um, 
Wow, that is fantastic. Good work. Wow, that's great. I love I love both of those concepts because uh, the CE credits, everyone everyone loves having different opportunities to, to gain those. Um, and ideally, the, the CE is rubber meets the road. Uh, and I especially love the idea of the, the office hours uh, capability. Is it was that lightning? Uh, no, <laughs> that was just one of our our lights just went out. Um, oh, we have okay. spotlights here for like camera lights, like yeah, photography so lights. And I think one of our bulbs just burnt out. <laughs> yeah, I can do something like this. Let me just yeah. turn that off so that nothing else. Yeah, no fires <laughs> yet, Carson. <laughs> No, that, is, that, is so, that is so outstanding. I'm so tickled to hear about the the office hours because I, I know that one of the one of the, the things in the toolkit um, that you know made a difference uh, for folks is is having someone who cares and has having some knowledge uh, to help with uh, any of the gray areas. And so that's that's awesome. Yeah, I think it'll be a success. Yeah, she's really good at talking to our libraries, as as Tom said. Um, she made that personal connection by going out there and visiting them. And it was kind of interesting. We talked about that. She, she, after the BTOP grant, her original reason for being here, um, she came and talked to a lot of us here at the commission and had a different kind of, I don't know if it's a opinion, a different view of how libraries are doing out there. We, we have a lot of staff here at the commission. We can't always get on the ground and to all the libraries. As Tom said, we have 260, 70 public libraries out there, but we're the library, the commission for all libraries in the state too, so those aren't the only ones we serve, and we don't always get to be in their libraries. And in that grant, we had 140 something libraries that she, because we were, in, we were installing equipment and increased broadband and um, furniture and whatnot, and she physically went to all of them, which was a huge um, thing to, to make that connection, that personal connection there, and yep. she'd be able to bring back ideas from them. And now they, it, we're, it's helped us just with everything else we do now. They're more, um, they're ready to jump on anything that we kind of suggest to them <laughs> a lot easier. I think that helped lead into the Sparks well, grant. Now that's kind of a big deal. Would you repeat what you just said? That's a big deal. The the which part? The the, 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 the I'm sorry. I'll tell you what I, what I caught. You said that that they're listen that that your client libraries have a they're, they're listening a little bit more carefully uh, at the suggestions that are coming. And I think uh, and I, that 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 came out because I've, I you know I, I work for you know quasi uh, governmental like state. Uh, agency, and I know what it's like again to come in and and have credibility uh, with uh, with local staff because he has time to do things that are not um, not valuable. And so I'm sorry, I just caught that, and I'm like, that's real, that's wonderful because that's building a trust relationship that benefits um, the library, really benefits patrons. Um, and it's related to what you said at the very beginning about we're the big government coming in and telling them what to do. Yes. And, and they hate that they, you know, fifty percent that they hate that. They don't want to know. Yeah. They don't like that. But, and but we're not that. I mean, we are a state agency. But and I, we always talk about libraries are different than a lot of other uh, public organizations and schools and things. And we're here. We really are here to help. That's our whole job is to make your job easier at the library. Um, and we do put out a lot of great resources and things, but I think getting physically into those buildings and because only because we had this huge grant where she could travel to those locations, um, it made that little in. And now she can call someone who she visited from those grants on the fly and say, hey, we want to get you on the Sparks thing. You're going to do it. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so wonderful. Yeah. Anybody have any other questions? Any comments? Anything? Um, anyone who's used it? Nobody said they've used it yet, but that's that's okay. Yeah, that is. I, if if this is your first uh, entree, please uh, grab it and use it. We will definitely be pushing it more. It's going to be in. Um, we're going to be doing one of those um, sessions with Holly. Um, it's going to be part of my E-rate um, as as a regular thing now, and anywhere else, and anything else we can use it in. Um, I'm also adding it to our, I mentioned uh, the Scooting Education, um, we do um, library, public library accreditation. Our libraries get accredited and then they can, um, if they go a certain process and they can get more state funding. And I'm adding it to their, those pages as well for libraries to figure out um, how can I increase my accreditation by getting better internet. And so I know that's a thing that they can use to do that. So I'm adding it to that process as well. So it's going to be everywhere. You're not going to, you're going to, I'm not gonna let you stop hearing about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Please keep keep it coming. It's music to my ears. 
Carson, you want to repost the link again uh, for the download? Yeah, let me see if I can find it. If you well, want to go to the website, you can just do that as well. That's the let me pull up. I'll be. I've, I'll, I have so many slides. Um, <laughs> here's okay. here's the short link. This will turn into a different link. Uh, this is our, our wonderful friends at Internet Two are are hosting um, uh, the link itself. So I'm going to copy that over. Um, but it's uh, www.internet2.edu forward slash cgl. And if you're super hip. You'll put in that last forward slash because it makes it that much easier for the lookup to happen. Uh, see, there's a little piece of geeky information <laughs> uh, that, that, that uh, people don't talk about it that much. Um, so I'm going to bring this up um, and I'll show you what the page looks like uh, very quickly. Um, here's the explainer video, and that's the first place if you're if you're if you want to refresh what the toolkit's about, hit that first. It's it's like four and a half minutes long. It's it's not too bad. Um, we have lots of supporting documents. The most important ones are the Broadband Toolkit, which is up here at the top, and it's in a, a Word doc form, uh, format because we want you to, to take it and use it, uh, and then the Broadband Improvement Plan. Um, if you would like to see our work, all the work that went in and the different things that we put together, uh, every document uh, that we have and uh, much of the data that we collected, of course, it's scrubbed, the data scrubbed for a confidentiality. Um, of those responding, um, we uh, we have it all right here. So if you want to see um, like examples of different broadband improvement plans, things that we suggested, or language that we use, um, that's a place that I would suggest looking through and grabbing stuff that you can use um, and, and use it for yourself. Uh, but it's all here. We want you to we want you to use it and to do good for your communities with this toolkit. Of and now your slides too. Um, people always ask about this because um, I you, you just show as you're going through. There's a lot more slides to, than what we showed today. Um, um, we can link to that if you have them somewhere online, or yeah, I will. Um, um, do me a favor because I'm on the road. We, I know like no one cares, but um, I'm a <laughs> library. I'm a technology consultant, so I'm constantly on the road. This morning, um, uh, I will be like running from here to do some uh, some site work in uh, California. Um, mm -hmm. Please get a hold of my assistant, Bonnie, and ask her for a, a, a PDF, and we'll get that to you. Absolutely, yep. And then that'll be available for everyone um, along with the archive when we put that up. I would good. be there, no problem. Right on. Very good. All right, we're a little after 11 a.m. Central Time. That's okay. Um, anybody have any last-minute desperate questions or comments or things you need to say? Get in there. Any last-minute words from you, Tom? Or Just uh, I feel very fortunate to be a part of the whole project mm -hmm. and working together with another state agency on that shared mm -hmm. effort. I think it's great for Nebraska and it can be very good in other states that forge the same kind of partnership. Mm -hmm. So yeah, as I said, we've been very successful working together and I think it's gonna we're not gonna stop. <laughs> so keep doing more things. <laughs> Outstanding. Thank you so much, Nebraska, for being such a, a, a wonderful example of collaboration and, and uh, getting things done. Um, continues to be an inspiration for me, so I can't wait to see what happens uh, from here. Thank you. Thanks, Carson. All right. I am going to pull back presenter control to my screen here. Okay. And actually, I'm not sure where I even have it on the screen. Let's see here. Very uh, good. Because we are going to. And I better, uh, better go. <laughs> Don't want you to be late, no. <laughs> That's right. I, I negotiated with my client to be able to do this this morning, and they were very nice. So, uh, yeah. but I better, get, I better get to the site and get to work. All right. Thank you, Carson. Thank bye you bye. very much, Carson. All right. All right. So for everyone online, um, that's going to wrap it up for today's show. Um, it will be on our live, our live, not live, well, live. Website, Encompass Live website, which um, you can get from our Library Commission webpage under we have education and training. We have Encompass Live here, but you can also just uh, Google us with whatever your search engine of choice is. And Encompass Live so far is the only thing on the internet called this. <laughs> Nobody can take that name. Um, and the recording will be here. Um, here's our upcoming shows, but underneath that is a link to our archives. And they are just the um, most recent ones at the top. So it'll be right here at the top. We'll have a link to the recording. As I said, we'll be um, 
is available through our uh, YouTube channel. This is last week's show. And then we'll link the presentation that I will get from Carson's assistant. We'll add that as well. Um, for everyone, anyone who is here today live on the show who will register, you get an email from me, let me know what's that ready. We'll also post it out to our Twitter and our Facebook. We do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live, which is, there we go. We got a link here for that. Um, so if you are big on Facebook, give us a like over there. We post reminders. Here's a reminder to log into today's show. Um, when the recordings are available, when new shows are coming up, we, um, no, I don't want to log in right now. We post them all here as well. So um, give us a like over on Facebook and you'll get notified there. Um, in our archives, I just want to let you know while we're here looking at that, this is the archives of the um, entire history of Encompass Live. Um, this is now our 11th year. We started in January 2009. Wow. Yeah. Um, and everything is here going all the way back. Um, there is a search feature here. You can look search the entire archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want current up-to-date information. Um, just pay attention when you're looking at a recording of what date it was originally broadcast on um, because there will be some old information in here, some outdated, some things that have been updated, some services or products or links that don't work anymore because it's been so long. But we are librarians, so this is what we do. We are five things. <laughs> so they will always all be out there for you. So just pay attention when you are looking at the archives there. Uh, so I hope you join us for next week's show when we'll be talking more about technology. Um, you can see we don't always talk about that. We've got some diverse reading, health education resources coming up, OER. Um, in May, we're going to be talking with our newly appointed state poet, Matt Mason. Um, he'll be with us here. But next week, we're talking about the ethics behind emerging technology. Um, this is the second in a two-part series that our uh, technology innovation librarian, Amanda Sweet, is doing. On February 13th, she talked about what is emerging technology and a recording for that is available. So if you might want to watch that in preparation for next week's show, she'll be talking about the ethics behind emerging technology. So please do sign up for that and any of our other shows that we have coming up. Um, other than that, that wraps it up. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you for coming over today. Thank you. And we will see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.